Recently, I was interviewed by Liberty McCarter on the Know Why podcast about the subject of the pagan origins of Christmas. We posted part one of that interview a few weeks ago. Now it's time for part two. This is this is the second part where we get into the subject of Jesus Christ himself. Did, did the stories about Jesus actually originate with ancient pagan myths? You know, my answer is no, but we're going to dive into the historical research and the reasoning behind all of this in this interview. And so I really wanted to share it with you because I felt like we got into it in, in great detail in a very simplified and uh, uh, easy to digest fashion, but we got into the details. So I just loved how, it, how uh, she conducted the interview. It was very well done. So go check out knowwhypodcast.com or you can find the Know Why Podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcast, um, and I think you'll be greatly benefited from this from this podcast for sure. But I also wanted to share it with you here on The Bible Explained. And uh, so here's my answers to Liberty's questions about the pagan origins of the Jesus story. Welcome to the Know Why podcast and Merry Christmas. Josh Barnes is back and he is busting some Christmas myths. If you didn't listen to the last episode, Make sure you do that because we asked whether Christmas has pagan origins. And through a detailed conversation with Josh, backed by a lot of historical evidence, we found that, in short, no, Christmas is not pagan. But if you want to dive deeper into some of the questions we asked, go back and listen to that episode and you can find it at knowwhypodcast.com. But now we're actually going to turn to Jesus. Who is he and why is his birth such a big deal? By the way, Josh Barnes is a pastor from New Hampshire with a master's degree in theology. He also has a popular YouTube channel that you should check out called The Bible Explained. And we are so happy that he's here today. Thanks for joining us again, Josh. Uh, Thanks for having me, Liberty, and uh, Merry Christmas to you, too. Yes, so it's such a joyful time of year, and I'm, I'm really excited that we get to talk about um, this holiday that so many people celebrate and really dig into why we celebrate it, because that's all what we're all about at the Know Why podcast, is knowing why we believe what we believe and knowing why we do what we do. So um, just to get started out, when we talk about Jesus, a lot of people say that the story of his birth is actually not that special. It's just a copy of several different ancient myths. And I know that you have some information about this. Yeah. So this is a, a very pop, this itself is a myth. <laughs> um, the, the fact that Christ, the story of Christ was copied from ancient myths is unsubstantiated and is, you don't actually find it any, any proof for this. The, the, the challenge with this part of our examination of Christmas is that we're not dealing with historical documentation, we're dealing with the lack of it. People are claiming things that just you, you, you don't find in documentation. So I'll give you a couple examples. I think probably the three most popular examples are Mithra, Horus, and Dionysus. Uh, Mithra was a Persian god um, in Persian, would you know, be, we'd be looking at like 1200 BC where, where you'd have it originated. Horus would have been like an Egyptian god, 3000 BC, probably ish. And then you've got Dionysus, Greece. So we're looking at like 500 BC ish, you know, Mm -hmm. and people will say things like uh, Mithra. Mithra was born of a virgin, born on December 25th, had 12 disciples, performed miracles, was dead for three days and was resurrected. Um, And they worshiped Mithra on Sunday. But if you actually look at any at these claims, we'll just take we'll we'll, we'll break it down. Mithra, if you look at what historical doc, now remember we're talking about the Persian Empire, so we're mm-hmm. we're talking about very little. We don't have a lot of scraps of paper left. Right. <laughs> Papyrus, right? We've got we've got etchings on stone and things like that. So it's it gets dicey when you're looking at wh- where's your source material for this. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to find. What we know that they believed about Mithra in Persia was that Mithra emerged fully grown out of a rock. So that's not a virgin birth, yeah. by my count. <laughs> um, Mithra, there's no date anywhere given for a Mithra's birth. So December 25th, people, if people say Mithra was born December 25th, ask them to show you where their source document is that, that states that, that someone believed that. 
1,200 years before Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just not existent. Um, they say that Mithra had 12 disciples, but Mithra had either, depending on what sect of Mithra worshipers you look at, some of them believe he had one disciple, and others say that he had two. Now, I know that one and two are the numbers in 12, <laughs> that doesn't equal 12. Right. <laughs> um, performing miracles. Uh, Mithra is not known for p- performing miracles, actually. Um, the only thing he's really known for that we know of is killing a bull. Like every time you see him, he's stabbing a bull with a knife. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he, the fact that he was dead for three days, there's no record of Mithra dying. Resurrected, obviously, that would require him dying, so there's no record of that. And um, there is a uh, a cult. There, there's a couple of these that have cults that show up after Christianity, and there's some cl- that claim that the cult of Mithra worshipped on Sunday, um, which was like Christians. But the cult of Mithra, even though Mithra dates back to the Persian Empire, the cult of Mithra would have been after the beginning of the church. The same thing happens with uh, the cult of Dionysus and, and, and some other cults. Mm-hmm. Horus is very similar in the Egyptian, the Egyptian god. They say he was born on the 25th, born of a virgin. There was a star in the east that announced his birth. He was adored by three kings. Uh, he was started teaching people when he was 12 years old, and um, he had a a baptism. Uh, he was baptized at 30 and started his ministry um, and that he had 12 disciples. But all of this stuff is just false. It, like Horus, we know that, that they that they believed that he was born on July or in August, not on December 25th. Uh, they believed that uh, they did not believe that he was born of a virgin. The, the myths surrounding <laughs> Horus's origin is is not He's not virginly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his, basically, his mother, uh, Isis, reanimated his father, Osiris, in order to, uh, like he was dead, in, in order to, you know, procreate with them. Um, so that's not a virgin. Um, there was no, there's no evidence for a star in the East, no evidence that he was adored by three kings, no evidence that he taught anyone when he was 12, no evidence that he started um, a ministry at 30 um, or being baptized. Um, and uh, some say that he was actually embalmed or he, he, he would have died at 30. Um, and there's no evidence that he had 12 disciples. As a matter of fact, he actually had four followers of Horus and 16 blacksmiths. So he had 16. If you counted them all up, you have 20, not 12. Right. Um, so Horus doesn't, doesn't fit. Dionysus, they say the same thing about Dionysus. Was Dionysus born on December 25th? No, there's no source for that. Dionysus was the god of wine. So that's where they try to draw a connection. Yeah, Jesus made water into wine. Mm. That's like a copy of Dionysus. Mm. Okay, well, he's the god of wine. Um, and uh, that that means that what the, the Greeks would say that he would just manufacture wine out of nothing. He, he actually never took water and turned it to wine in any ancient myths. He just manufactured wine and gave it to people. Mm-hmm. Um, so you still have a different thing, but plus Jesus isn't known for the water to wine. That's only in one of the four gospels. So it doesn't really fit at all. Right. Um, he wasn't born of a virgin. He was a born of a fair between Zeus and his daughter. He wasn't called the King of Kings. He, he wasn't called the Alpha and Omega, like they say that he was. Um, and uh, he wasn't ripped. He wasn't resurrected. They say he was resurrected, but he was actually ripped apart by the god Titan, and then his heart was placed inside a new mother and reborn. And that story, even if you say that's a resurrection, actually the story of that resurrection, if you call it a resurrection, postdates the beginning of Christianity. It's, we're actually in the ADs now. So none of this stuff, like you hear all of these claims about, oh, it's just a copy of all these other myths that were floating around the Mediterranean during the time. If you look at any of those myths, you can't find any evidence that any of these things were believed about these about these these mythical gods before Jesus came on the scene. Mm, so interesting. And then speaking of, you know, historical evidence, I think you've kind of already addressed, you know, the fact that the things people say now about those myths weren't really believed at the time that we assumed they were. You know, those weren't the things that people were saying at the time. But what about Jesus' birth? Um, we have, you know, how it's recorded in the Gospels. Is there historical evidence for it actually happening that way? So that is a great question, and I could spend an hour on this. But 
But the, um, the cool thing that we often just forget is that the gospel accounts are historical documentation. Like this is, these are people in the first century writing what they are claiming to be true facts that they witnessed or that people that they collected accounts from witnessed. As a matter of fact, um, an archaeologist named uh, William Michael Ramsey, he used to be an unbeliever, and this, he, I think he's, he's dead now. He's kind of an older guy. Uh, but uh, he wrote, after studying the book of Luke and with his archaeology, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. He should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Wow. And the reason is when you look at what Luke writes, especially you look at Luke 1 through 4, he's like, hey, look, Theophilus. I'm going to write you a, a, a collection of all the accounts that I've, I've, I've earnestly investigated and looked into to find out which ones are true so you can know what happened um, to, in the ministry of Christ. This is historical documentation. And the fact that you, we also have another eyewitness, Matthew, who also writes an independent account that sounds somewhat different than Luke. So it, it's definitely independent. It wasn't, didn't come from the same source. And then you've got John, another eyewitness who also writes, and Mark, who writes the story of Peter, an eyewitness. You've got four eyewitness accounts, and Luke's is a collection of eyewitness accounts. These are historical document. This is historical documentation. And then when you look inside of the, of, the, of the documents, if you look inside of Luke, um, there's so much about Luke that evidences his truthfulness, even in the Christmas story. So in Luke chapter 2, there's a census where the, you know, um, Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about the census is we have a lot of documentation from the Roman Empire that Caesar Augustus had counts of how many people were in Israel, how many people were in Judea, and how many people were here, and how many people were there. But we have no documentation of any census. We know there has to have been censuses because he had the numbers. We just don't have the documentation of the census until we find Luke. Luke provides us the documentation of the thing we knew must have existed. And Luke is then this historical document that explains how uh, Caesar Augustus got these numbers. It's, it's really fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a historical document when we read mm -hmm. the Bible. It's not just, of course, it's written by the Holy Spirit, but it's also a true historical account. That is, um, yeah, I think a lot of people just aren't aware of, and this is something that we'll address on the podcast and dedicate um, entire episodes to, but just how special and unique the Gospels are in terms of their historicity compared to so many other historical documents that people just, you know, accept as being accurate without, you know, very much of a thought. And then there's, you know, so much more evidence that just shows the validity of the Gospels as historical documents, which is um, super fascinating. So thank you for telling us about that. And we will dive into that even more in the future on the podcast. But let's talk about Jesus. So within the Bible and the framework of the scriptures, um, his birth is really significant. So I'll kind of ask this at the same time, and then you can um kind of divide your answer how you see fit but it was really his, at the time Jesus birth was very significant to the Jews who had been um following you know kind of the god of the old testament as we might think of today for a long long time and then Jesus you know for Christians today people who follow Christ obviously it's very significant we have a whole big holiday surrounding it so why is Jesus birth so significant to the Jews at the time and then to Christians today so um i'll start i'll start with the christians um because i think it's it's more obvious <clears throat> um to us because you know we're gentile uh, most of most of um, us here in america are gentile christians so um it's, it's significant to Christians, I think, first of all, because it's significant to the Gospels. If the Holy Spirit is going to inspire three of the four Gospel writers to speak about the birth of Christ, um, it must be important. This is one of the things I think we often forget when we're reading the Bible. We, we read something and we say, I don't, I don't know, so I'm kind of bored by this. Okay, who cares if it's boring? It's important to God, so maybe you should you know, go ahead and be willing to be bored to read it because he wants you to know it, you know, like mm. um, we, we often get kind of selfish when we read the Bible. Right. <laughs> but if it's, 
if it's important to the Gospels, it should be important to us, whether we like it or not, you know. But it's also really exciting, too, because it fulfills prophecy. And I think we'll probably talk about this because I know some of some of the questions that, that you want to get to will probably will refer, deal with prophecy. So I won't get into detail at this moment, but the intricate fulfillment of prophecy in the Christmas story is mind blowing. And, and it should excite every Christian because it shows that we're not just closing our eyes and believing these things in the Bible. We actually have evidence and the fact that these things were prophesied 700 and 1500 years before they happened are, uh, should, should excite us. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, another reason probably would just be because there's all kinds of theological implications to the, to the Christmas story, like God taking on flesh, the hypostatic union. I mean, like this is big brain stuff. And so it's definitely a significant a significant issue to Christians. Oh. To Jewish people, I think it should be, we have, they should have all the same significance as Christians because they should be Christians. Like they should accept Christ as their Messiah. But just from the Jewish perspective, in addition to the Christian perspective, um, remember that it was it, it, when, when God gave the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, he says, um, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. And in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The, the Jews have this wonderful calling of God that through them, all nations, meaning me and you, Liberty, if, if Liberty, I, I don't think you're uh, an Israel by, by I'm birth. I'm not, so. yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, me and you, we, we get this beautiful privilege of being part of the kingdom of God and, and knowing Christ that came through uh, the Jewish people. That was one of the greatest fulfillments of their calling ever, mm-hmm. the coming of the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah. Um, and it also is a foreshadowing of his second coming. Like he's, he's born and then he's announced by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is born a few months before him. It's all a foreshadowing of a few months before Christ comes again. There's going to be another prophet that announces that he's coming. Um, uh, you know, he, he then is in his first coming, he presents himself as king. He preaches the kingdom of God. These are all foreshadowing of him return, his return to actually claim the kingdom of God on the earth. So all of that is, is significant to us, but extremely significant from the Jewish perspective. Yeah. So fascinating. And yes, I do want to talk about all of that too, because this is something that, um, you know, the people of God had been waiting on. um, And like you said, that had been prophesied. And so, you know, this was the moment um, in terms of scripture and the people, you know, who were following the one true God at that time. But I want to get to that question in, in just a minute. But let's go back to something that we've kind of referenced at the beginning um, that all these other myths claimed that, oh, you know, so and so was born of a virgin as well. And you've kind of gone through the evidence of saying, actually, no one really believed that at the time. But the Bible does claim that Jesus was born of a virgin. And that's kind of odd, you know, to, to someone who wasn't raised in the church, hearing that all the time, why does that even matter? Like, why is that important? Okay. So the virgin birth, I would probably break it down to three categories, why it's important. Number one is prophecy. Um, from the, from the very first prophecy about the Messiah, it said that he was going to be born of a virgin, although it's not as clear as we might want it to be in Genesis three fifteen. After Adam and Eve fall, this is written by Moses, so we're talking 1,500 years before Christ or more. Mm-hmm. And I will, build, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, he says to the serpent, God says, and between thy seed and her seed. Now, it doesn't appear as apparent, it's not, it's not as apparent to us as it was to the Jewish mind. But the Jewish mind, the seed comes from the man and the woman is the egg, right? Right. Yeah. How can you have seed from a woman? Um, this doesn't make sense. He, he, in the very first prophecy is saying there's going to be enmity between the woman's seed and the woman's seed, meaning the Messiah is going to bruise the head of the serpent. The whole point from Genesis three was already that this was going to have to be a miraculous birth 
without a man. Wow. Um, it, it's quite spectacular. So prophecy is very important uh, uh, as to why the Jesus had to be born of a virgin, because it was prophes- prophesied to be that. The other, the other interesting thing is sin nature. Some people would call it original sin. I, I don't really like that term. Um, but we know Romans chapter 5, you can go to verse 12 if anyone wants to look it up. I'm, for sake of time, I'm not going to read it right now. But 1 Corinthians 15, 22, they talk about how through Adam, we all inherit this death. We all naturally sin, and as a result of our natural sin, we naturally die. And it's an inheritance from Adam. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesus, being born of a virgin, it's, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a main point of, of most theologians that, that they'll say, listen, if, if he's not inheriting the sin from Adam because he's not getting it through a man, then he's able to not have a sin nature. He was... He, he was tempted like as we are. He went, he took on the form of man in the curse in that he was, he was, he had pain and suffering and all that, but he didn't have a sin nature, um, uh, uh, an inherent sin in him, which is really important for, for Christ. But I think more than, more than those two things, like the main reason why it's important that Jesus was born of a virgin is because it makes him unique. Um, when he says, that he's the, the son of God. He means it in a way that no one else can mean it. Uh, it. It proves something too, because there's an evidence, you know, for, for um, uh, men and women when, when there's a, a virgin, um, there, there's an evidence of, of being a virgin. I don't want to be too, too descriptive there, but, mm-hmm. but yeah. that Joseph would have known that this is actually true. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that there wasn't anyone else involved. Uh, Joseph would have, would have been able to, Say no, this is all false, and run away from it. <clears throat> um, he 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 knew that it was true. So there's there's all kinds of packed in proof. The fact that there were other miraculous births in the Bible, like the birth of Isaac, uh, his mother was very old past the time of conception. The birth of of John the Baptist, same same deal. But you have these two that are very similar. Jesus is is unique. There's no one else like it. It never happens before. It never happens again. Because he is unique, and he's he's the Son of God in a unique and provable way, and I think that's why it was so important that he was born of a virgin. Wow, that's also fascinating, um, and I love that uh, you know and understanding of the prophecy in Genesis as well, which um, is just you know again when we read in things in our language little details kind of do get lost in translation of just, you have to understand the context and the original language and like the meaning that, you know, was carried in the words that they used and wrote down that we don't always pick up. And so kind of understanding just even the verbiage of, you know, the woman seed versus the serpent seed. That is so interesting. I'm learning so much, but um, finally, (laughs) you know, let's get back to, um, some of those prophecies, because we've already debunked the theory that Jesus' birth is just a copy of earlier pagan myths. However, like you've already alluded to, over a thousand years before he was born, his birth was prophesied in Scripture. And this is one of the reasons why it was you know, such a big deal to followers of God you know, when he was born. So can you talk some about, about those um, prophecies that happened so many years before Jesus was born and how they were fulfilled. Yeah. So um, I'm going to stick to mainly the ones about his birth. There's so many prophecies about Jesus that were, that were provably written hundreds of years, even thousands of years, uh, over a thousand years before Christ came. Mm -hmm. And we can prove this. Um, and so in order to narrow it down just for our study today, we'll, we'll just talk about the ones that kind of directly impact Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you'll see some fascinating uh, prophecies of, of the crucifixion in Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, those sort of things. Um, but the first one I would say is Genesis. Written by Moses, we're talking 1,500 plus years before Christ. Um, and he's quoting God from the beginning of creation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a pretty spectacular prophecy about uh, that strongly implies that a woman is going to give birth, uh, give a virgin birth. So this definitely predates any, even if all of these myths were true, 
it definitely would predate all those myths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it would actually explain those myths. So if there is, if there is from before the flood of Noah's day, there is a, um, a oral tradition that the seed of a woman is going to defeat uh, Satan, then you would expect maybe there might be some myths that pop up about virgin births. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, myths about uh, miraculous births that uh, if you, if you look at like um, uh, the uh, Nimrod and the story of Nimrod and his wife, but his wife was clearly not a virgin. It was his wife. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, supposedly their son was a miraculous birth and all this type, type of stuff. You would expect those type of myths to show up since you already have an oral tradition from um, Adam and Eve uh, about a virgin conceiving. So that's, that's expected. You actually would think there'd be a lot more of it. In Daniel chapter 9, though, there's a really interesting prophecy that deals with when the Messiah would come. And it narrows it down. It's a long study, um, but it, it narrows the, pro the, the coming of the Messiah down to basically between 30 and 33 AD. It's got to be right there when the Messiah comes, which is, of course, we know exactly when Jesus came and walked into Jerusalem on a donkey, you know, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, pro mm -hmm. proclaimed himself as king, was put to death. And it says that after that, the, the prophecy itself, Daniel 9, um, chapter 26 says, after three score and two weeks, which is, is complicated how the weeks are counted, but they, they count right down to the Messiah. Um, but after that, the Messiah will be cut off, meaning he'll be killed, but not for himself. Not, it won't be, he'll be innocent. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So we know that after Jesus died in 33 AD and rose from the dead, that in 70 AD, what is that, 37 years later? Mm -hmm. Titus um, in the Roman Empire, just the, the emperor Titus, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, which is exactly what was predicted after the Messiah came. So the Messiah had to come around the 30 to 33 AD time. And it had to be before Israel, J Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So we now know who's the Messiah. It, it's got to be Jesus. If it's not Jesus, then no one's the Messiah. And so this is why people were, there was a lot of mess messianic expectation when Jesus was born. You have Simeon and Anna in the temple that are waiting to see the Messiah. They're like, the Messiah is going to show up here soon because in 30 years, 33 years, he's supposed to die, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really powerful fulfillment of prophecy, but I would like to, I'd like to kind of take us to Isaiah because Isaiah is written provably 700 years before Christ. I say provably because people have argued about Isaiah being so clearly about Christ that it had to be written afterward. Um, after Jesus, but then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are, which in which we found copies of Isaiah that predate Christ by over a hundred years. Wow! So we know this is written before Christ. There's no question whatsoever. In Isaiah seven, there's a prophecy you're probably very familiar with. It: Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Now that prophecy isn't as potent as we might think, because Jesus was never called Emmanuel. It was talking probably about a young woman who would, who was a virgin, who was going to go and get married, and then was going to have a child in the time of Isaiah and name it Emmanuel. But it was clearly a picture of a virgin conceiving later, unmarried, and uh, bringing a child who was Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, Jesus being God with us. So, uh, the New Testament writers actually use this in Matthew. It, it uses that prophecy of that child being born back in Isaiah's time and, and slaps it onto Jesus to show that this was all a prediction of the real virgin who would bring the real God with us in the future. So that's a really interesting comparison. What I think more potent is Isaiah 9, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Mm -hmm. That means that the birth of Christ is a pretty important thing. Isaiah 9 talks about how, about his birth. But the one that just blows me away is Isaiah 60. And I'll, I'll kind of like say this and then I'll shut up. <laughs> um, Isaiah 60 is fascinating. Let me, let me read you a little bit of Isaiah 60. Yeah. Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 is, gives us the fact that the Messiah would be born during a period of darkness. 
Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. When the Messiah comes, it'll be a period of, of, of really dark times for Israel. Certainly is that. They've just been conquered by, by the Romans about 60 years earlier. And uh, now they're back in darkness. Um, uh, then in verse 3, it says, that when the Messiah comes, it says, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So Christ coming is, a pic- is pictured by a star in the sky, mm-hmm. the brightness of thy rising, and that kings would follow it to come see him. Wow. And then in verse four, it says, lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They, sh- they come to thee. They- thy sons shall come from far. So these kings are coming from a long way away, it says thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side, thou shalt hear, shall see, and flow together, thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee, meaning now there's going to be not just people saved in Israel, people are going to come to the Messiah from Gentile nations, no way Isaiah would predict 700 years before Christ that when the Messiah comes, he was going to be for everyone, mm, yeah. <laughs> Isaiah would have thought it's for us, right? And then in verse six, it says, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, meaning there's people coming to see the Messiah who are coming from the east, camels and dromedaries, it talks about in verse six. Then in verse seven, it says, the flocks of Kedar, meaning shepherds and sheep shall be gathered together unto. So what Isaiah picture, pick, uh, gives us is they're going to be, it's going to be during a time of darkness, kings of Gentile nations uh, uh, from the east are going to come and they're going to. Uh, there are also going to be shepherds there. And in the end of verse 6, there's something really cool. It says, The multitudes of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, and they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. I mean, wow. the prediction is mind-blowing yeah. that, they were going, that these Gentile kings were going to come from the east. They were going to bring gold and incense as a gift to Christ. It's It's quite fascinating, 700 years before it happened. Yeah, wow. That is so detailed. And um, of course, then, you know, later on in the Bible, when we read about Jesus' birth, we read about the shepherds coming to worship him and kings uh, from far away coming to, uh, or wise men, you know, coming to worship him when he was young. And that's probably ringing a lot of bells for people and the nativity scenes that we see around um, at Christmas time. And the fact that all of that was predicted 700 years before is just so amazing. And so that's our time for today. But Josh, this has been such an excellent conversation. And I hope for our listeners that it has given you a lot to think about um, and maybe inspired you to go do some digging of your own. Go Feel free to go to knowwhypodcast.com and check out the links that we have posted there to go along with this episode and dig into the scripture references that we've talked about as well. But before we sign off for today, um, anything else you'd like to add, Josh? Well, not not specifically. Just thank you so much for having me, Liberty. And I, I love diving into this. And, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come back anytime to talk about the scriptures. I'm always game. <laughs> Well, awesome. We appreciate you. And we definitely do want to do that. I mean, there's so much that we've talked about today that I feel like we've just scratched the surface on. And these are all going to be topics that we want to dive into in even more detail in the future on the Know Why podcast. So thanks again, Josh. And thank you for listening to the Know Why podcast. Again, I, I just can't say thank you enough to Liberty. I think she did a great job with this podcast. The, what I've seen from her podcast has been all good. Everything I've seen from Liberty, I, I agree with. She's just a wonderful Christian uh, lady who's who's attempting to serve the Lord and really is providing a great resource for people out there. So I really encourage you to go check out the Know Why podcast. Merry Christmas to all. Don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments below, and we'll see you next time.